feel like I'm losing my mind Is everybody in the world blind? Please, Lord, give me a sign, a sign Welcome back to FAQ The Madness. We respectfully exercise our First Amendment right to publish interactions with government officials through the unbiased view of a camera. Let's jump into another ref. Recording. This is part two of a three-part series of the same document reading the order granting in part defendant's motion for summary judgment in Slade, Douglas, and individual plaintiff v. City of Los Angeles, Officers Ibana and Officers Wheeler, the defendants. Uh, we left off our previous video around page 12, and we will pick up where we left off. The right not to be detained without probable cause under WIC section 5150 is clearly established under the law MAG v. Wessler 960F 2D 773-775, 9th Circuit, 1991, explaining that with regards to cases discussing, quote, the Fourth Amendment standard in the context of seizure of the mentally ill, all have recognized the proposition that such a seizure is analogous to a criminal arrest and must therefore be supported by probable cause. See also triplet 144 Cal APP 3D at 287, recognizing that WIC section 5150 was amended, quote, to require probable cause for detention, end quote, and adapting, quote, the test for probable cause for a warrantless arrest for a section 5150 detention, end quote. WIC section 5150 includes, excuse me, provides authority to detain individuals when there is a probable cause that they are, quote, a danger to others or to themselves or gravely disabled, end quote. WIC 51, section 5150A, although the court applies an objective standard in evaluating qualified immunity, the court notes that in this case, it appears that these officers were actually aware of this legal standard, further undermining their request for qualified immunity. Ibana's deposition testifying that the justification for detention under a 5150 hold is, quote, danger to self, danger to others, and gravely disabled, end quote. They list Exhibit 18 as the filled notebook divider. Noting that an application for detention under WIC Section 5150 may be initiated when an officer concludes there is probable cause to believe any or all of the following conditions exist, end quote including danger to self, danger to others, or gravely disabled. Defendants' arguments in favor of qualified immunity rest on disputed facts. For instance, defendants argue that the officers would not reasonably be on notice, quote, that it was improper to detain, end quote, a person who, quote, acted inappropriately during the investigation, end quote, or who was, quote, not cooperating, end quote, but these alleged facts are disputed, including whether Douglas acted inappropriately and whether they detained him because of his, quote, inappropriate behavior, as opposed to behavior calling 911 that was appropriate and lawful. Furthermore, even if it were the case that there is no decided case on precisely the same facts that would place the officers on notice that their conduct was unconstitutional, a, quote, materially similar case, end quote, is not necessary when faced with, quote, an obvious case, end quote. White v. Pauley, 580 U.S., 73, 79 through 80, 2017. See also Brousseau, 543 U.S. at 199, citing Hope, 536 U.S. at 738, for the proposition that where a constitutional violation, quote, was obvious that there need not be a materially similar case for the right to be clearly established. The court finds that interpreting the facts in the light most favorable to Douglas, this is a rather obvious case. For example, the question could be restated as whether the officers were on notice that it was improper to detain a person who was doing nothing illegal or threatening. In resolving this question, the court resolves the second part of the qualified immunity test 
and finds that no reasonable officer could believe that there was a probable cause for the detention. Based on the record before it, the court finds that the defendants have set forth no undisputed facts other than the initial communication from the VA, from which the court could even can even draw an inference that Douglas was a danger to himself or others. This is the standard to detain as clearly established by WIC section 5150. Accordingly, qualified immunity is not applicable to the officers here. B. There are disputed issues of material fact with respect to plaintiff's excessive force claim, second cause of action. Defendants seek summary judgment on Douglas's second cause of action for excessive force in violation of 42 U.S.C. section 1983 on the basis that the officer's use of force was reasonable. However, the defendants have not shown there is no dispute of material fact in relation to this claim. 1. A reasonable jury could find that the officers did not use reasonable force. Quote, Police use of force is excessive and violates the Fourth Amendment if it is objectively unreasonable under the circumstances. A reasonable jury could find that the officers did not use reasonable force. Quote, Police use of force is excessive and violates the Fourth Amendment if it's objectively unreasonable under the circumstances. End quote. Zion v. County of Orange, 874 F.3D, 1072, 1075, 9th Circuit, 2017. To ascertain whether a violation has occurred, courts balance the, quote, nature and quality of the intrusion on the individual's Fourth Amendment interest against the countervailing government interest at stake, end quote. Graham v. Connor, 490, U.S. 386, 396, 1989. Internal quotations, uh, quotation marks omitted. To ascertain the government's interest at stake, courts consider the non-exhaustive Graham factors. Quote, the severity of the crime at issue, whether the suspect poses an, in, uh, an immediate threat to the safety of the officers or others, and whether he is actively resisting arrest or attempting to evade arrest by flight. End quote. ID at 396. The most important factor is whether the individual posed an immediate threat to the safety of officers or others. ID. In determining the reasonableness of police conduct, courts must account, quote, for the fact that police officers are often forced to make split-second judgments in circumstances that are tense, uncertain, and rapidly evolving about the amount of force that is necessary in a particular situation, end quote. Graham, 490 U.S. at 396 through 97. Quote, the reasonableness of a particular use of force must be judged from the perspective of a reasonable officer on the scene, rather than with the 2020 vision of hindsight, end quote, ID at 396. Moreover, the Ninth Circuit has repeatedly held that excessive force claims are fact-specific and rarely appropriate for resolution on summary judgment. See, for example, Smith v. City of Hemet, 394 F3D, 689-701, 9th Circuit, 2005. A. Type and amount of force. First, the court assesses the quantum of force used against Douglas. Douglas specifically complains of the handcuffing and grabbing, including the continued handcuffing with his hands behind his back for a period of time despite a pre-existing medical condition, that he had made the officers aware of, as well as forced medical treatment once he was taken to the hospital. Footnote 7. In this complaint, Douglas complains that the medical treatment he was forced to undergo qualifies as excessive force. The defendants acknowledge that this is a basis for the second and third cause of action and do not attempt to convince this court that forced medical treatment would not be an excessive use of force under these circumstances, but merely assert that Douglas has presented, quote, zero evidence that the officers directed any such medical care procedures, end quote, motion at 38. Although in his motion, Douglas fails to directly respond to this argument by defendants, it is clear to the court from the PSUF that Douglas has put this at issue based upon his own sworn deposition testimony and is therefore not properly considered undisputed. 
See, for example, PSUF 137 through 139, describing that officers told, quote, Ricky, that they needed to find something in Douglas's system to justify his arrest. Ricky agreed to do so, and Ricky then injected Douglas without his consent. Defendants response that these facts are directly contradicted by the officer's declarations and not corroborated by any other witness or document is of no moment given that these facts are supported by Douglas's own sworn testimony. It will be for the jury to determine whether what Douglas alleges actually occurred. Therefore, it is inappropriate to grant summary judgment on these claims with respect to the allegations of forced medical treatment. Defendants essentially argue that handcuffing on its own cannot be unreasonable nor excessive. Motion at 37. While the ordinary use of handcuffs to arrest an individual generally is considered a low quantum of force, handcuffing in a way that affects an individual adver adversely due to a medical condition can lead to finding of excessive force. See Alexander v. County of Los Angeles, 64 F.3D, 1315, 1323, 9th Circuit, 1995. See also McFarland v. City of Clovis, noting, quote, a seemingly low quantum of force can be excessive if the officer knows about a plaintiff's disability or pre-existing medical condition and uses force that affects the disability or pre-existing condition. Here, while Douglas told the officers he was disabled shortly after being handcuffed, it is undisputed that Douglas did not say that the handcuffs were hurting him and exasperating his pre-existing condition until around four to five minutes after being placed in the patrol car. Therefore, the court finds that the quantum of force prior to this point to be low. Nevertheless, after this point, Douglas continued to express that the handcuffs were causing him pain and exasperating his pre-existing condition and requested multiple times to have his arms and handcuffed in the front, which the officers refused to do at any point until the paramedics came approximately 25 minutes later. Therefore, viewing the facts in the light most favorable to Douglas, the court considers that the quantum of force used was elevated due to the extended handcuffing despite Douglas's request. B. The government's interest. Second, the court applies the gram factors to determine the strengths of the government's interest in the officer's use of force here. Defendants argue that LAPD policy, quote, requires handcuffing a possible 5150 detainee behind his back but provides no support for the statement nor cites to any undisputed fact. Motion at 37. The cited evidence actually indicates that handcuffing was not required in this situation. Exhibit 5 LAPD manual. Providing officers discretion to use handcuffs under section 217.36. While defendants also state that belligerent arrestees in particular must be handcuffed with their hands behind them, as discussed above, the court finds it disputed whether Douglas ever was or appeared like to, likely to become belligerent. Therefore, it is disputed whether handcuffing Douglas was required or necessary given the circumstances. While a jury could find that the officers reasonably believed that Douglas's complaints regarding his injuries were made solely to try to get out of being handcuffed, a jury could also find that Douglas's complaints were legitimate and that the officer's failure to exercise such discretion supports a finding of excessive force. Viewing the facts in the light most favorable to Douglas, the court finds this latter interpretation of events plausible. The court also notes that the defendants do not make any arguments under the Graham factors supporting their interest in using force, appearing to simply argue that whatever force used was, quote, objectively reasonable. Motion at 37. Footnote 8. Again, Defendants of an argument of reasonableness relies on the characterization of a number of facts that are highly in dispute. See motion at 43, arguing that Douglas, quick, quote, very quickly shifted to anger, was erratic, and increasingly agitated, end quote. The court finds that a reasonable jury could interpret the events in the video to find that Douglas was not erratic and only became agitated upon provocation from the officers. But the law requires weighing the force used against the government, government's interest in using it. That is exactly how reasonableness is determined. 
see Graham 490 U.S. at 396. Quote, determining whether the force used to effect a particular seizure is reasonable under the Fourth Amendment requires a careful balancing of the nature and quality of the intrusion on the individual's Fourth Amendment interest against the contravailing government interest at stake, end quote. While it is true that the reasonable test is not capable of precise definition or mechanical application, end quote, the Graham factors help guide the court's consideration, i.d., quoting Bell v. Wolfish, 441 U.S. 520, 559, 1979. The court finds that an application of the Graham factors here in conjunction with the totality of circumstances, weigh against finding that the force used was reasonable. I. Severity of crime. The first factor clearly weighs against the government's interest in using force against Douglas. As there was no crime at issue, it is undisputed that the officers came to Douglas's residence to perform a welfare, welfare check. The purpose of a welfare check is for the benefit of the individual at issue, not because they are under suspicion of any crime. Therefore, this factor does not support finding the officer's use of force reasonable. 2. II. Whether Douglas posed an immediate threat. The second and most important factor of the Graham analysis also does not support the officer's use of force in this instance. While defendants say that Douglas made an, quote, aggressive move, end quote, towards Wheeler, this is not tied to any undisputed fact, and a reasonable jury could interpret that Douglas was not aggressive at any time, motion at 37. Defendants simply point to no fact showing that Douglas was an immediate threat to anyone at any time. Wheeler, in fact, testified that he did not believe Douglas posed a threat to anyone other than himself at the time that he was a, quote, little guy, end quote, Wheeler deposition. Therefore, this factor does not support finding the officer's use of force reasonable. III, whether Douglas resisted arrest. The third Graham factor also does not support any governmental interest in the use of force here. It is undisputed that Douglas complied with being handcuffed and in no way tried to resist or evade detention at any time. Accordingly, this cannot support the government's interest in using force here. C. Balancing of interests. Considering all the circumstances, a reasonable jury could conclude that the officer's handcuffing and related actions toward Douglas were excessive. Footnote 9. While defendants note that other factors may be considered on the Graham test, the parties do not analyze any other factors, and the court does not find that additional consideration of other factors would change the outcome of the reasonableness analysis. While the court considers that some moderate degree of force was used on Douglas, defendants have not set forth any substantial government interest in using any force at all on Douglas. Accordingly, Defendants are unable to prevail on summary judgment on the undisputed facts. 2. Defendants are not entitled to qualified immunity. Defendants are not entitled to qualified immunity on Douglas's excessive force claim based on the undisputed facts before the court. Footnote 10. Again, the court cannot find that the right at issue must involve the nuance of a WIC Section 5150 investigation, where the individual's, quote, exhibits outward and obvious signs of belligerence, end quote, because a reasonable jury could disagree that there were any such signs, motion at 51. As an initial matter, the court finds it well established that it would be a violation of constitutional rights to apply any force when there is no probable cause that the individual has done anything illegal or threatening. See Hope 536 U.S. at 738, where a constitutional violation is, quote, obvious. Quote, there need not be a materially similar case for the right to be clearly established. 
Regardless, the court also finds it clearly established that it would be a violation for an officer, quote, to knowingly use handcuffs in a way that will inflict unnecessary pain or injury on an individual who presents little or no risk of flight or threat of injury, end quote. Stainback v. Dixon, 569, 7th Circuit, 2009. Noting that, an op- that, quote, an officer's otherwise reasonable conduct may be objectively unreasonable when the officer knows of an arrestee's medical uh, problems, end quote. Walton v. City of Southfield, 995 F2D, 1331, 1342, Sixth, Sixth Circuit, 1993. Quote, an excessive use of force claim could be premised on an officer's handcuffing the plaintiff if the officer knew that the plaintiff had an injured arm and if the officer believed that the plaintiff posed no threat to him. Footnote 11. The Ninth Circuit has also denied qualified immunity as to an excessive force claim where plaintiffs told police officers officers that he was ill and the officers denied his repeated request to adjust the handcuffs because his med- because of his medical condition. Alexander, 64, F.3D, 1350, 1315, 9th Circuit, 1995. Here, there is a dispute of material fact as to how seriously, if at all, the officers considered Douglas's complaints in considering the force to exercise against him. 12. Footnote 12. Given that the officers summarily rejected any request to change the placement of the handcuffs to Douglas's front due to alleged mandatory policies, it is unclear whether they ever legitimately considered Douglas's complaint since their statement could be interpreted as such that they would not have changed the placement regardless of the circumstances. Moreover, while the position of the handcuffing eventually changed when the paramedics came, Douglas sat in the patrol car handcuffed for close to half an hour, complaining that he was in pain. See Alexander 64F3D at 1323, 9th Circuit, 1995. The denying qualified immunity where plaintiff alleged his handcuffs Quote, were readjusted only after he had been already handcuffed 35 to 40 minutes, end quote. As such, the court finds the officers are not entitled to qualified immunity here. C. There are disputed issues of material fact with respect to plaintiff's retaliation claim, third cause of action. Defendants bring summary judgment as to Douglas's third cause of action for retaliation in violation of the First Amendment on the same basis as the excessive force claim. However, as explained above, defendants have not met their burden of demonstrating that there are no disputes of material fact as to whether the officers used reasonable force on Douglas. Moreover, Douglas bases his retaliation claim on his unlawful detention as well, which the court has also found is in dispute. 1. A reasonable jury could find that the officers retaliated against Douglas. In order to plead a violation of the First Amendment, a plaintiff must show, uh, quote, that one, he was engaged in a constitutionally protected activity. Two, the defendant's action would chill a person of ordinary firmness from continuing to engage in the protected activity. And three, the protected activity was a substantial or motivating factor in the defendant's conduct. Cap v. County of San Diego, 940F3D, 1046, 1053, 9th Circuit, 2019. As defendants have conceded that the 911 call was protected speech, the court addresses whether defendants' detention of Douglas would chill or deter a person of ordinary firmness from further engaging in the activity. Footnote 13. Although defendants correctly state that the inquiry is objective, and whether Douglas himself was chilled is irrelevant, they go on to argue that Douglas was in fact not deterred. Motion at 46. The court does not find whether Douglas was deterred relevant to the analysis. Motion at 46. The court finds that the detention of an individual for doing anything including making a 911 call would be likely to deter a person of ordinary firmness from engaging in the same activity. 
Footnote 14. For this reason, the court does not find compelling defendant's argument that the First Amendment claim fails because Douglas was not prevented from later speaking to the supervising officer. Finally, the undisputed facts show that the detention and handcuffing both occurred during or shortly after Douglas's started. Douglas started calling 911. C. Pratt v. Rowland, 65 F.3D, 802, 808, 9th Circuit, 1995. Explaining that timing can be properly be considered as circumstantial evidence of retaliatory intent. It is also undisputed that Wheeler stated multiple times that the detention was due to the engagement in the protected activity. In one instance, Wheeler appears to repeatedly address Douglas's attempted 911 call by stating, quote, you don't get to do that, end quote, and, quote, that's not going to happen, end quote. In another, Wheeler states to Douglas that what he did, referencing the 911 call, was, quote, against the law, end quote. Therefore, a reasonable jury could find that officer's conduct was motivated by retaliatory intent. Accordingly, accordingly, summary judgment must be denied as to Douglas's retaliation claim. 2. Defendants are not entitled to qualified immunity. Again, the court finds that the right at issue here, the right to be free from retaliation due to exercise of free speech, is not only clearly established, but quite obvious. See Ballantin v. Tucker, 28F, 4th, 54, 65, 9th Circuit, 2022, noting that it is established that it is unlawful to arrest someone, quote, in retaliation for their First Amendment activity, notwithstanding the existence of probable cause, end quote. Cap 940F.3D at 1059, quote, and it was clear that a government actor could not take action that would be expected to chill protected speech out of retaliatory animus for such speech. End quote. Here, Wheeler's own statements show that he believed that Douglas's call was illegal, and therefore, this belief was likely a substantial factor, if not the sole factor in his probable cause analysis. Defendants have not attempted to argue that any such belief would be reasonable, and the court does not find that any reasonable officer would have such a belief. Therefore, the officers are not entitled to quali uh, qualified immunity as to the retaliation claim. D. There are disputed issues of material fact with respect to plaintiff's ADA claim, fifth cause of action. Defendants bring summary judgment as to Douglas's fifth cause of action for violation of the ADA. However, defendants have not met their burden of demonstrating that there are no disputes of material fact as to this claim. 1. The ADA claim properly applies to all defendants. Defendants argue that Douglas's ADA claim can only be brought against the city and cannot be brought against the officers individually. But Douglas has clarified that he is bringing the claim against the officers in their official capacities, motion at 55. The court finds that Douglas may proceed with his official capacity claims and that the city is vicariously liable for the acts of the officers. See Becker v. Oregon, 170F, Supplement 2D, 1061, 1066, D, or 2001. Sorry, I don't know exactly how that's supposed to read. Quote, Although individual defendants may not be sued in their individual capacities under Title II of the ADA, they may be sued in their official capacities because suing an individual in his official capacity is treated the same as suing the entity itself, citing Kentucky v. Graham, 473 U.S. 159, 16, 1985. See also Duval v. County of Kitsap, 260 F, 3D, 1124, 1141, 9th Circuit, 2001. Quote, when a plaintiff brings a direct suit under Title II of the ADA against a municipality, the public entity is liable for the vicarious acts of its employees. End quote. Two, 
a reasonable jury could find that defendants failed to accommodate Douglas. As Douglas does not appear to argue for discrimination theory of liability, the court addresses this claim under the failure to accommodate theory. See Sheehan v. City and County of San Francisco, 740F, excuse me, 743F 3D, 1211, 1232, 9th Circuit, 2014. Explaining that a plaintiff can bring an ADA claim for failure to reasonably accommodate a disability in the course of an investigation or arrest where the failure causes the person to suffer great injury or indignity in that process than other arrestees. The plaintiff bears the initial burden of producing evidence that a reasonable accommodation existed, i.d., it is undisputed that Douglas is a disabled individual and that he requested multiple times to be handcuffed with his hands in front of him as a reasonable accommodation for his disability. And the court finds the officers did have it discretion with how, if at all, to handcuff Douglas. See Exhibit 5, the LAPD Manual. Defendants argue that the officers were not put on notice of his back condition prior to or at the time of handcuffing, but the crux of the claim is that the officers failed to reasonably accommodate Douglas after he informed them of his disability and requested an accommodation. Although defendants argue that Douglas's quote, that Douglas, quote, might attempt to escape or wish to gain more mobility for reasons other than a disability, motion at 54, it is not undisputed that Douglas was, quote, volatile and, quote, belligerent, and the undisputed facts reflect that there was never an indication that Douglas tried to escape or behaved in a threatening manner. Further, it is undisputed that the officers had at least some indication of the disability prior to the handcuffing. Based on Douglas's statement regarding being a disabled veteran and his pointing to the disabled placard, it may be it may be that they did not believe any of this, but it will be for a jury to decide whether they disbelieve this and what implication that has for Douglas's ADA claim. Defendants next argue that Douglas was was accommodated because almost half an hour later Douglas was placed on a gurney and his arms were repositioned at his sides. Motion at 54. However, there is still an issue of whether the officers failed to reasonably accommodate Douglas prior to that, as Douglas alleges that their failure to change the positioning of the handcuffs did cause him great injury than he otherwise would have suffered. Accordingly, the court finds that there are material facts in dispute as to the ADA claim. Three, a reasonable jury could find the officers acted with deliberate indifference. To recover damages on his ADA claim, Douglas must show deliberate indifference, which requires, quote, both knowledge that a harm to a federally protected right is substantially likely and the failure to act upon that likelihood, end quote. Duval v. County of Kitsap, 260F, 3D, 1124, 1139, 9th Circuit, 2001. Quote, when the plaintiff has alerted the public entity to his need for accommodation, the public entity is on notice that an accommodation is required, and the plaintiff has satisfied the first element of the deliberate indifference test. End quote. ID. Quote, in order to meet the second element of the deliberate indifference test, a failure to act must be a result of conduct that is more than negligent and involves an element of deliberateness. Here, Douglas told the officers of his disability and requested a reasonable accommodation in the form of having his hands placed in front of him. Accordingly, the first part of the test is met. Moreover, a, res a reasonable jury could find that the officers acted with deliberate indifference in rejecting Douglas's request. Wheeler's statement that he would not make the accommodation immediately after that Douglas first requested it can lead to the reasonable inference that Wheeler did not seriously consider Douglas's request. Moreover, it appears that the officers were laughing and joking about Douglas's statement 
about his, about his disability at certain points, which could support a finding of deliberate indifference. Exhibit 2. Therefore, the court denies summary judgment. E. Douglas has failed to meet his burden on his Monell claim. Douglas has also sued defendants under Section 1983 for municipal liability. Although Monell allegations are included in the complaint, the, par the parties meet and confer. Douglas agreed to limit his Monell claim to the single contention that LAPD's policy, practices, and procedures as it relates to welfare and institutions code section the welfare and institutions code section 5150 investigations permit officers to enter residence without a warrant or ex exigent circumstances in violation of the 4th amendment footnote 15 douglas does not appear to dispute that his monel claim is so limited or that all other Monell claims and allegations have been abandoned and may be dismissed with prejudice. Accordingly, the remainder of the Monell claims are dismissed with prejudice. In Monell, the su Supreme Court held that municipalities are, quote, persons, end quote, subject to liability under Sections 1983. Monell v. Department of Social Services of New York, 436 U.S. 658 690 1978. For the municipality to be liable, it must cause a constitutional violation, as a municipality cannot be held vicariously liable under the theory of re respondent, respondent superior for the unconstitutional acts of its employee. ID at 691. A plaintiff seeking to hold a municipality liable may do so by alleging one of the following. 1. That a municipal employee committed a constitutional violation pursuant to an expressly adopted official policy or a long-standing practice or custom. 2. That a municipal employee was an official with final policy-making authority. 3. That an official with final policy-making authority Ratified a subordinate unconstitutional act. Gillette v. Dalemore, 979 F2D, 1342, 1346, and 47, 9th Circuit, 1992. Here, Douglas bases his Monell claim on an alleged LAPD policy that under a WIC Section 5150 welfare check, officers are permitted to enter a residence without a warrant and in the absence of any exigent circumstances. To, pre to prevail on this theory, plaintiffs must show a long-standing practice or custom which constitutes the standard operating procedure of the local government entity. Gillette 979 F2D at 1346. The custom must be so, quote, persistent and widespread, end quote, that it constitutes a, quote, permanent and well-settled, end quote, city policy. Monell 436 U.S. at 691. Quote, a Section 1983 plaintiff may attempt to prove the existence of a custom or informal policy with evidence of repeated con constitutional violations for which the errant municipal officials were not discharged or reprimanded. End quote. Gillette 979 F.2D at 1349. Thank you for watching. If you have a video you'd like for us to cover, use the submit link in the description or pinned comment. If you enjoyed this one, consider subscribing and hit the bell to be notified of future content. Be sure to check out all of the other content we have for your edutainment. We will continue to respectfully exercise our First Amendment rights and published interactions we have with government officials. Remember to like, share, and leave a comment. It's the easiest way for you to let us know your thoughts about our channel. I wanna be the greatest. Everybody on the face shit. I look around and feel like everybody is the fakest. I make this every day and I'm impatient.
shit Hoping one day I blow up from the basement Statement, the top is so vacant I don't need shit that I think is amazing Waiting for my day when I'm playing Sold out shows for a thousand faces Hey, give me that crown Get in my way and you'll be put down It ain't your place, all this my town If I want that shit, then I'll get it right now I'm losing it, the noose if it's some loose shit A stupid myth, you choose to live or choose to dip You choose to fight or lose your grip and lose a gift, oh.